Wow. Careful, you can only go down. From I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was my talk. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, David. That really was phenomenal, and I'm I'm very flattered that you would put that amount of work into an introduction. That's <laughs> I'm serious. That's I've never experienced such a thing. That's phenomenal. Um, can only go down, as you said. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I turn this on. A couple of disclosures before I start. The AMP technology that David mentioned has been patented and I'm an equity holder as well as consul consultant and receive royalties from a company, Archer DX, that we started to commercialize this. I'm also a paid consultant for those companies. David asked me to talk a little bit about precision medicine and translating basic science findings into the clinic. So I put together a couple of overview slides just to get started. Clinical translation, we, talk, we all talk about it, and it should be easy, right? There's really, especially for the scientists in the audience, I bet many of you have findings and you're like, this could be really useful. What's wrong with those clinicians? And how come they can't get our tests or our ideas implemented in the clinic, right? What's the big issue? between basic science and clinical impl implementation. There are a number. And the, is the issues can be insurmountable for a, for a lot of people. So the first thing that we ask is on the clinical side, I'm, I'm wearing my clinical laboratory hat, is, is the discovery valid? Does it actually do what the basic scientist says it, it did? And that often needs an independent validation. Um, with clinical type samples. So validity is, is difficult to prove and is a, is a big hurdle. And then utility. So validity and utility are two separate things. I think those in the clinical labs are well aware of what those two things mean. But just because something is valid, we have a test to tell what your eye color is, doesn't mean that it's useful. And the utility bar is quite high and is critical in the clinical labs for things like getting paid. So if you want to get reimbursed and you want your new discoveries to be implemented, you have to prove utility. So validity and utility, those are two critical issues. Money. Basic scientists and clinicians often argue who has more money, right? Everyone thinks the other side has more money. But I'll tell you something, it's difficult on the clinical side to obtain the money to launch a new let's say test, I'm a laboratory, I'm a pathologist, to get money to launch new tests is often quite expensive. A lot of the tests we're talking about today have new technologies that are quite expensive. And so there's argument about who's gonna pay for translation. The NIH is not gonna pay for it. It really has to come at this side from the, here NIH and corporate support can help, but over here it's really hospital support. And those dis discussions are long and difficult. Regulatory, to move things into the clinic, you need regulatory approval. It has to occur in a laboratory that's CLIA approved minimally. We're moving towards possible requirement of FDA approval for all kinds of tests that we normally do in the laboratory. And there's billing and other regulatory, there's compliance and quality regulation. So there's a huge amount of regulatory oversight here that you don't have here. And usually, especially for the clinicians, I'd like to point out one thing that's that's, I mean, for the researchers, that's obvious to the clinicians, is in the clinic, the clinic is different than the research lab in one simple way. And that simple way is you can never be wrong in the clinic, right? And that's, our clinicians know that, but you can't be wrong. And I don't mean sometimes, you can never be wrong, especially for tests that are important for patients. So um, regulatory and quality is, is a barrier here. And then politics. Politics, I think, to me, is maybe the biggest barrier to doing anything. Getting everyone to agree and have a single vision about what an institution needs or what patient needs is really, really challenging. And I think where we don't do a good job is finding people who want to do this. Who wants all these headaches? It sounds easy to say we're going to do it. As I said, it should be easy, but it's not. And because these are a lot of headaches. And if my career, I've done anything, is I've kind of tried to take on some of these headaches and grease the wheels from here to here. So that could be the whole talk right there and we could just take questions. <laughs> um, but I think it's important. It's important for both basic scientists and clinicians to, to appreciate and understand all of this. <laughs> 
Okay, David gave me a little bit of background, which I can skip through really fast. He would asked me to provide a little bit of background. Um, I think you might be interested to hear a little bit of the backstory for um, some of the discoveries. Um, I started in Charles Lee's lab as a, um, really as a molecular diagnostics clinical fellow. And I realized early on that I would never learn karyotyping. I don't know anyone here is doing karyotyping. But it's, a, it's an entire separate field. I trained in pathology and anat anatomic pathology, and I thought karyotyping would be easy. Like the first week I spent in cytogenetics, I realized that was going to be another two to three years, pro probably more, until I could become an expert. And technology that came out of Stanford and came out of UCSF around the same time began to use printed microarrays to look at, at genetics, at copy number, um, not yet in patients, but copy number um, alterations. And Charles Lee was one of the young cytogeneticists at the Brigham where we trained. And I saw him give a talk on this new technology and I said, you know, that's what I want to do as a clinical fellow. I want to see, can we ask a simple question? Can we, can we take some patients with, with known microdeletion syndromes that are hard to pick up by normal karyotyping? Can we pick them up using, uh, um, using microarrays? I wasn't asking any big genetics questions. I was really asking a clinical question. Could we bring technology into the lab that could allow me to sign out cases because I could never do a karyotype? And indeed, we found the expected microdeletions. This is a case of DeGeorge syndrome on a, with a 22Q uh, deletion, um, which we found. Everything looked beautiful. You can see the data looks really, really nice. These were very early generation arrays and the data looked great. There was a few problems. And some of the problems on the arrays, this is showing chromosome one from two different cases, is we found individual dots on the arrays, individual backs on these arrays were showing fluctuations. They were showing gains or losses. And no one really uses back arrays anymore, but for those of you who don't use backs, these are large. These are 100 to 200,000 base pairs of sequence. And so when you see a single probe deflection here, that's not like a 50 base pair sequence. That's 200,000 base pairs of sequence difference between the case and the control. And we were saying there must be something wrong with how they printed the arrays. It really took several months, as, as um, David's quote showed, it took several months before we realized actually some patients shared these mm. and that these were not artifacts of the technology. Um, and eventually we woke up to say, oh my God, we're sitting on a huge amount of variation in, in individuals. And all this came out of a clinical fellow just wanting to do some small project. Um, Harvey Greisman, who is in the audience here, Dr. Greisman and I were postdocs together. He was at the bench next to me. And this would not have happened if it wasn't for Harvey. I'm happy he's here because Harvey, we didn't believe this data. And Harvey had some ideas about how to validate it. And we developed this fish assay down here, which Harvey had told me, you know, John, you really should try doing fiber fish. And so we took patients with different, different gains or losses and did fiber fish. We took their DNA, we stretched them out and hybridized them with the same back that was showing deflections on the arrays. And we used individual gene probes. This is for an amylase locus on, on chromosome one. Individual gene probes allowed us to count the number of genes. And so we had patients with six copies of amylase, patients with nine tandem repeats of amylase and patients with 12. And this correlated perfectly with the array data. And at this point we said, oh, this stuff is all real. And this map of however many hundreds or thousands of copy numbers was not an artifact, but was true. And that led us to nature genetics. And I think David summarized that really well. So um, some careful technology development on the back of really what was a simple fellows project. The next year I moved to Mass General and my copy number career kind of morphed into a cancer copy number career. I was lucky enough to, to arrive at the time where EGFR mutations had just been discovered the previous year in 2004 at MGH. And we were working on another project which was in gastric carcinoma. And there was a finding in the Haber, Daniel Haber laboratory that showed that patients, oh, I'm sorry, cell lines that had high level amplification of the MET gene were exquisitely sensitive to a MET inhibitor. This may not seem that amazing right now to the crowd, but at this time, this was a big deal. And you can see the number of cell lines. It was probably 20 to 30% of all the cell lines that we had in gastric carcinoma in this, in this, at that time show that. And there was a hope that 20 to 30% of all stomach cancer patients 
would be able to be treated with this MET inhibitor. <coughs> So our lab, this is one of the first tests we, we set up in our kind of translational research lab, was for MET amplification, and we began to study gastrocarcinomas and screen them for entry onto this drug. This drug uh, was a Pfizer compound. We went through the regulatory to get this, the regulatory uh, hurdles to get this open as a phase one trial, and this drug went on to be known as crizotinib. So we had crizotinib study open in 2006 based on MET fish, and we screened 400 um, gastro GE junction uh, gastric or esophageal tumors, and we ran into a problem. Um, the trial, I would call it a miserable failure in that we only found 10 patients. While the cell lines showed 30%, we were finding very few patients with MET amplification in real life. So this is coming to that validation finding, that validation issue I mentioned earlier. When you tried to clinically validate this finding, we just couldn't find the patients. And this red line is the MET amplified patient population. And you can see they do miserable. So these patients not only were rare, but when we found them, they were so sick they couldn't be put on trial. So <coughs> by, the, by the beginning of 2007, this trial was essentially closing down because it was not going to be practical to run it. And we were fortunate. I would say the perfect storm, so to speak, happened when this, this landmark paper came out of Japan showing EMO4-ALK fusions in, in some lung cancer cell lines. One beautiful thing about crizotinib, while it was a really good MET inhibitor, it had this off-target effect that it was an ALK inhibitor as well. So it hit ALK as an off-target effect and no one talked about it, it was buried in the protocol. Um, but we knew that. And so this paper came out and we said maybe we should maybe we should look for some patients like that. And it really was a perfect storm. We set up a, a fish assay rapidly and started screening our patient population at MGH. And by the end of 2017, within three or four months of this paper coming out, we treated our first patient with ALK positive lung cancer. And the response in the first patient was amazing. The patient was going to hospice and within two weeks walked out of the hospital. Within a month was skiing. And I remember this very, very specifically. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic to talk about. We talk a lot in medicine about standard of care. What is standard of care in the hospital? This certainly was not standard of care nationwide. No one had even known about it. We only knew about it at MGH. But for our clinical oncologists, ALK testing became standard of care that day. Right? So within three weeks of this one patient, we were testing every single patient, every single lung cancer patient for ALK. And um, the responses were phenomenal, and um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but the responses in the phase one trial were about 60 to 70% of the patients showed a significant response. Um, so those are the, I would say, the two main uh, big scientific uh, contributions that I've made, but we've also done a lot of technology development this is a figure from Dr. Wu's paper where we, we use copy number variation to find some specific loci in the genome. There are a lot of copy number variations, but only a few of them are large deletions. That is that you might have two copies of something and I might have nothing, right? At large stretches, 50,000 bases, where we just don't have the same sequence at all. So we, we looked through the data that existed and found those and we used them for in situ analysis. It's essentially in situ genetics. So you can put a fish probe into those regions. Some people are plus plus, they have two signals. Some people only have one signal and some people don't have any signals by fish. And you can use that to track patients in the setting of bone marrow transplantation or chimerism. So that's, that's how we approach, we approach this, um, this paper. So Dr. Wu did, a, did an awesome job on that publication. Uh, we talked a little bit about ALK. We developed technology for doing just basic fish and, and developing the clinical cutoffs for, for doing fish. Um, we began to work on heterogeneity about 10 years ago. Similar to the copy number variation project, we were doing some simple clinical work. In this case, we were looking for MET and EGFR amplification in glioblastoma. And we stumbled across, in the clinic, we stumbled across cases that look like this. I don't know if anyone has seen Im these images before, but these are the most amazing pictures that I've seen of tumor heterogeneity, where within a single tumor, right, within a single field, you have intermingled cell populations. And these are, um, each of these are showing high-level copy number amplification of different genes. They're all receptor tyrosine kinases, 
and you can see they're all adjacent and mutually exclusive. So the ecosystem within these tumors are just, they're just amazing that how, how these, it's almost, I wouldn't call it conversion evolution, but they've all obtained RTK amplifications, but using different receptors, and they're all intermingled. So um, the issue here, I think, is how would you approach the therapy for a tumor like this, right? If you're thinking about targeted therapies, and you begin to appreciate that if there's this level of genetic heterogeneity, we really, really don't understand the genetics of many of the tumors. And currently we're developing, uh, we do a lot of NGS, and I think single cell sequencing clearly can, can make a big impact in problems like this. We're still developing a lot of fish-based analysis, and we've developed a multicolor fish assay where we do the equivalent, for those of you who know cytogenetics and fish, multicolor fish, or um, where you would take two probes, um, I'm sorry, a single probe and label it in two or three colors. And so essentially barcode each of those probes. And if you barcode them, then you can, you can multiplex them to higher levels. So we have like a 15plex and a 20plex um, um, fish assay now. Let's see if the movie works, because it's always cool to see movies. The movie's not working, but you can see this is a single a single nucleus and we can count over 15 genes simultaneously at the same time. And our, our thought process was that we're probably just seeing the tip of the iceberg here in terms of copy number heterogeneity, variability and heterogeneity in these glioblastomas. So we still continue to develop in situ techniques to get higher and higher plex levels. And then on the sequencing side, um, Dr. Wu didn't really mention some of the genotyping work we did. Probably the biggest impact that our lab has, has actually had in precision medicine is the launch of multiplex genotyping. We didn't develop the basic technology, but in 2008 we were the first lab to clinically start looking at more than just one gene at a time. We started looking at over 60 or 70 mutations in all patients, and I think this helped push a lot of laboratories into the area of precision medicine where you you're not just looking for EGFR mutations, you really want a complete genotype. So Snapshot was our original, the name of our original assay, which is just a simple multiplex SNP detection assay. Um, this was our workhorse for about five years, and with all of the fusions um, that we began to work on, ALK being one of them, Ross we'll talk about, we, uh, we started developing NG, uh, some NGS-based technologies. The technology um, that came out of our lab is called Anchored Multiplex PCR, as David mentioned. For the researchers in the audience, it's essentially a five prime race technology where you would put a gene specific primer in one sequence and you would use an adapter sequence to do PCR. So you can PCR across a junction where you only know one partner. Essentially, it's a gene specific primer. That allows you to do um, fusion identification where you only know one partner. In the case of ALK, we talked about ALK. ALK might have many, many partners. EMO4 is the most common, but it might have many partners. And this allowed us to do that, which gave us the highest clinical sensitivity possible. And then if I have time at the end, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of our cell-free applications that we're currently working on. Okay, that's my background. Let's dip back down into precision and personalized medicine. So I would say the key change over the past 10 years for the field has been the introduction of the idea of a companion diagnostic. And why is that important? Well, the, the FDA determined about 10 years ago, and I, I think it was a, a fantastic idea, is to require that when, peop when companies are uh, trying to implement targeted therapies, that they simultaneously, in one at, you know, at one time, a single one-stop shop, apply for a test that would make sure those patients will respond. And that may have happened naturally, that may have happened by itself in the marketplace, but for the FDA required to require this was very forward thinking. It does help in some areas for the drug companies themselves. It does reduce the time to market for certain drugs. If you can identify the right pa patient population, you can get to, to, to market faster and you certainly can provide clarity on the, on the optimal use of a drug. So a lot of credit, I think, is, des um, is deserved by the FDA for launching this. There is a business case for, for doing companion diagnostics beyond it's just good for patients. Um, the amount of money it costs to, to launch and get approval for an oncology drug you can see here is over a billion dollars. There's money to be made. 
from re what's called trial reduction, reducing the number of patients for any given trial. So if you can find a targeted population, you don't have to do the trial in as big a population. There's a savings to be done there. And then, of course, you get savings from increasing your odds of being successful, right? The odds of any given trial being successful is higher the, the, if you have a good companion diagnostic. So it, it doesn't just make good medical sense, it makes good business sense. This is pulled from the FDA website. This is the current FDA approved companion diagnostics. And th I think this shows the glass half full and empty and what some of the issues around companion diagnostics are. Um, how to say this, the bottom line is drug companies with targeted agents need a companion diagnostic. So they have to develop one for their targeted agent. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the companion diagnostic that goes on the market is one that we want to use as the laboratory people, as the end users. EGFR is a good example. So there are all these drugs against EGFR mutations and each of them has their own companion diagnostic, right? That trial was run with a different companion diagnostic. So this is where I think the FDA's approach kind of breaks down a little bit. That as labor uh, laboratory professionals, how do we pick which one we're going to use and are they applicable to any of the individual different drugs? EGFR is one example. For those of you who know about pd one which I assume a lot of you do, pd one is a bigger problem even than EGFR and maybe we can chat about that for a minute or two. Okay. I did put together a slide talking about overall challenges of establishing a precision medicine program and I think you guys have gone through all of this yourselves but for those of you who'd like to learn a little bit more I'll go through it so there are strategic issues for sure for an institution is this really research or is this really clinical work I still get asked those questions all the time from both sides science and clinical side do you test all tumors or are we just doing advanced stage patients when do you start doing stage one and two patients uh, how do we determine financial sustainability and reimbursements? Is philanthropy the only way to do this? Or do you actually want to get reimbursement from insurance? And is your institution requiring you to break even? Our institution, I wouldn't say it's not been a requirement, but it's helped that we began to break even. Um, there are operational issues about how many genes and the size of a platform, the v validation themselves, what kind of specimens and the bioinformatics needed. And we've mentioned a little bit about regulatory you need to get patient consent, the FDA we talked about, and then finally, last but not least, probably the most important aspect are government and private payers and how do they think about what we're doing. And here clinical utility comes, comes back. Um, Joe Lenners, who um, was a fellow of ours and now is um, actually directing our molecular diagnostics lab, took over from me just this past year. Um, put together this publication in 2016 where he worked out essentially the entire clinical and billing infrastructure workflow needed to launch exome testing at an institution. And he put, this paper is amazing, I mean it's just worth taking a look at just for the figures that he puts together. He's, he's really a master at putting, putting together um, images to explain things. Most of us in the audience would say, okay, what we care about is really when is the test requested and do we have the sample and can we report it, right? Let's do the test, let's do the sequencing and let's issue a report. Um, and everyone knows that's a lot of work, right? That's a lot of work to put that infrastructure together but that's the easy part, right? That we actually know, that's a known amount of work to do this, to do it at a high quality level. Not everybody knows how to do it but with enough resources and people that's doable. But let's say you have another issue. You have a patient who says, do I want exome sequencing? Well, how doc, how much is it going to cost me? Do I have to pay for this? Right? What happens when a patient walks in? Is there any way that anyone in the audience knows to tell that patient how much they're going to have to pay? No, I guarantee you, no one in the audience knows. Right? Any of the clinicians in the audience probably are like, I don't know, I don't want to know. But we've had to put together a service. It's a it's an estimate service essentially that allows patients to call a number to tell them what their insurance is and what the CPT code is of the test they want to order and based on the current contracting between our institution and their payer we can estimate that your out-of-pocket expense is X. Right? This is a huge amount of work for an academic institution to have in place. I'm not even going to talk about pre-authorization and letters of medical necessity and pre-approval. 
Those of you in the clinical labs doing genetics now know most payers are moving towards requiring pre-approval for almost every test. This is a huge amount of additional burden on us. Um, so anyway, anyone who's interested in diving deeper into this topic, some of you may find it boring, others might find it exciting. He goes through all of, the, all of the issues involved. He also tells you who do you need on your team and how many years of experience and training they need to do each of those steps. So it's really a, a blueprint to launching exome sequencing. So I, I was really trained as a physician scientist. Um, I wasn't trained as a regulatory expert, but I've had to get involved, and I would say that's one aspect of success that we've had is willingness of people, myself and our team, to work with payers. In this case, this is a medical policy we put together with, with our friends across town at Brigham and Women's Hospital with Blue Cross, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. And I would say it's probably the most comprehensive next generation sequencing po medical policy in cancer that exists. I, I think it's something we're very proud of. We've gone through essentially all, all tumors and gone through the level of evidence supporting doing sequencing and personalized medicine in each of these tumor types and determined when and, and when they will and when they won't pay for all of these things. But you can see essentially all of these tumors under all of these clinical situations is now covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. To give you an idea, this is probably on the order of 10 to 20,000 man hours of work, right? And um, let's just say that was never something I was dreaming I would be involved with as a, as a researcher. Okay, so we're, we'll slowly get away from the regulatory stuff for those of you who are checking your emails now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might want to know what do we do at Mass General Hospital, at our institution? Do we do exomes for all cancer patients? Do we do large foundation medicine size panels? We actually don't. We've, we've tried to hold the line at we, what we call medium sized panels. So we have panels for each of these tumor types of about this size. We try and make it as broad as possible that there's interesting research that can be done, but small enough that it's cost effective, right? And balancing those two things is, is difficult. We do about 70 comprehensive genotypes per week. Our clinicians need this data back within two weeks. We have several tests that they ask back within 24 hours. So we have a rapid service that allows us to go to the, um, the interventional radiology suite to get certain biopsies immediately. Those get extracted right away and they can go on the sequencer um, within several hours. So that's, that's kind of what we do. These rapid service cases are, are unusual. <coughs> Okay, as I was putting together the talk, I was wondering kind of what direction I should go to. And lung cancer is certainly an area that I've spent most of my career working, probably a lot of you know something about it. But um, as I put some of the slides together, I realized how things have changed even in the last two years. And so um, I'm gonna take you through the current state of lung cancer as what I think personalized precision medicine can be and should be, right? And what you can do for a population of patients um, and I, I hope you, you find it interesting. It's a little bit encyclopedic as we go through different genotypes, but hopefully by the end you'll be impressed that, wow, the field has actually made incredible strides. And I'm not even going to be talking about immuno-oncology. So let's set that aside as, of course, IO has made fantastic strides. Let's talk about just targeted therapy, which has kind of gone under the radar a little bit over the past few years. So. This pie chart is a pie chart of the genetic alterations in lung cancer. This is a figure I would have made around six or seven years ago before really we started doing a lot of NGS. And you can learn a lot of things even from this, this pie chart. One, we have two common mutations in lung cancer, KRAS mutations and EGFR mutations. And then a long list of rarer, uh, smaller slices of the, of the pie. And so lung cancer is I think relatively unusual amongst the solid tumors in having, having this. I would say the hematologic malignancies, for those of you who, are, who deal with leukemias, you're used to this. You're used to having these very thin genetic slices where each one of them is actually a, a different disease. But lung cancer is like this, and you can see there's, there's things that are present at 3 and 4 percent, but you're going down to the order of 1 percent, and I don't even have the thinner slices that are, that are less than that. We'll talk about a few of those. Um, but it's impressive, 
and you'll s hopefully you'll see that, that we now have approaches to many of, of these in the clinic right now. It's not the future, it's the present. If you take more of a genomic look rather than this slice of the pie, it's hard to, it's hard to show these figures now because there are so many genes, but if you, this is a paper that showed the distribution of commonly mutated genes in lung adenocarcinoma. It's a, it's a nice figure to summarize a bunch of things. One, fusions are present over here. They're mutually exclusive from EGFR and KRAS mutations, other MAP kinase mutations. And they're about 10%, maybe 15% of all alterations in lung cancer. 10 to 15% are driven by gene fusion events, ALK, RET, and ROS being the most common. Um, EGFR and, and KRAS make up a big chunk, as we know. And there's a couple of clinical correlations that are worth pointing out. If you look at smoking, is this line, you don't have to pay too close attention, but you see there's very few red bars here, which are the smokers, down at this end. So EGFR in the gene fusion patients tend not to be smoking, and over on this end where we have KRAS or other mutations, you're seeing a lot more of the smoking, and the tumor mutation burden increases as you move to the right. So the total number of mutations here to the left is low per tumor, and goes up much higher. So smoking, tumor mutation burden high, and then single, single drivers, non-smokers over here on the left. And most of the IO trials, checkpoint inhibitor trials now, are excluding ALK and EGFR from, from their therapies and probably should start excluding some of these other ones as well. So I think that's kind of a nice overall um, picture and it, it shows you really how many mutations, there are a lot of mutations, but they're not, there's not an infinite number of mutations. Let's talk about EGFR for a few slides. I know probably many of you know about EGFR, but you may know, not know about how far things have gone. So first described in, mutations were first described in 2004. Mutations within the kinase domain of this receptor tyrosine kinase, resulting in constitutive kinase activity and exquisite sensitivity to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The development of resistance happened in essentially all patients with these first line inhibitors and led to, led to a lot of additional drug development. I would mentioned companion diagnostics can improve the development of drugs. I think this is a good example. This is one of the early examples of a targeted therapy. Obviously, Gleevec and CML was, was before this. But if you look at how EGFR inhibitors were developed, they were actually not developed in EGFR mutant tumors because we didn't know about it when those trials started. They were started in all populations, a traditional phase one type study. So uh, in this case, about 10% of lung cancer patients in 2003 showed a response. 10% response rate is usually enough to kill a drug, right? No one's going to take that drug on to clinical development. But there was something a little unusual about this 10%. When they responded, they really responded, right? The tumors really showed an impressive response. And there was a question, what's, is there a biomarker that explains that? And in fact, retrospective analysis of these tumors, the ones that responded, showed that they had EGFR mutations. Fast forward three, uh, three or four years, this is a paper coming out of our group, Leisha Sequist in 2008 published this, where now if you take just the EGFR mutant population and treat it with an EGFR inhibitors, you're not seeing a 10% response rate, but you're seeing a 60 to 70% response rate. So that may be common sense to everyone, but you have to understand at that time it was not yet common sense. The pivotal uh, IPAS study was published in 2009, uh, 10 years ago now in New England Journal, and did two important things. I think this is a really important paper to look at for anyone interested in biomarkers. The first thing is if you look at the EGFR positive population within, this was a large Asian study of lung cancer. If you look at the EGFR mutation positive po population, the EGFR inhibitor showed a si highly significant benefit, p-value less than 0.001, hazard ratio of 0.48. Equally important is this figure, which is the EGFR mutation negative population, right? This is equally as important to decide do we have to test patients or not? Because in this population, the EGFR inhibitor did not help. In fact, you can say it's harmed. Um, it harmed patient with a hazard ratio of 2.85 and a highly significant p-value, right? Does that make sense? So you both need to say yes, you have the mutation, you're going to respond better, and you don't have it, you shouldn't get it. And I'll come back to that in the immuno-oncology space in a couple of slides. That, just keep that, that in mind. This was a really good example. Uh, EGFR mutation is a really good example. Another paper we published with Lisa Sequist in our group where we began to understand the mechanisms of resistance, T790M being the most common. We had a few other mechanisms of resistance, MET amplification, 
some of the tumors come back as small cell. They start as adenocarcinoma. They come back as small cell carcinoma. Pathologists, I'm sure, have seen that. But let's focus on T790M, which is over half the patients. We were doing a, f a fair amount of T790M work um, early on. T790M mutation is an acquired resistance mutation that causes steric hindrance that prevents those drugs from binding. So we had good mechanis mechanism, mechanistic understanding of how it works. And if you were T790M positive at that time, that was a very bad sign because the drugs just didn't work. Fast forward to 2015, AstraZeneca had in the interim, as, they, as we learned more about T790M, AstraZeneca began to develop a drug that later became known as osimertinib, um, which actually had high efficacy against the, this mutant form, right? So if you can identify the main causes of resistance, you can develop specific drugs. And what's amazing is in EGFR resistant patients, this is the response rate to osimertinib, right? And you can see, again, 60 to 70 percent of those patients in the second line are responding. So the patients who live for 10 to 12 months on first-line EGFR therapy are now responding and, and being given an additional, at least an additional 12 more months on a single tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Pretty awesome. And then the probability of progression-free survival, as you can see now, is better if you had the T790M resistant mutation. So if you had that mutation, we have a drug for you, and those patients are now doing better. An interesting case for everyone, this is a patient who had an EGFR mutation. Uh, 12 months on erlotinib, developed T790M, went on to osimertinib, 12 months later developed new brain nets. Okay, so kind of the story I was telling you. 12 months on one, 12 months on the other, now came back. And what did we find is really fascinating. So these are really interesting little scientific um, stories. Um, we did not detect the T790M. So the osimertinib actually worked, essentially sterilized for the microbiologist, essentially sterilized the patient of the T790M. But the patient now came back, and I'm showing you here is the, the pileup, came back with a BRAF mutation, right? So I had the original EGFR mutation and now a BRAF mutation. So the tumor has changed its MAP kinase signaling now to, to BRAF. Uh, in our group and others have, have identified now multiple causes of um, resistance to osimertinib, including additional EGFR mutations, but all kinds of mutations within the MAP kinase pathway. And the game now being played is, can you develop a drug against this EGFR inhibit, um, mutation, but also can we begin to um, deploy drugs that might work against these other things? And take patients who formerly were passing away within 12 months, we're now giving them three, four, five, six years of life, and in many cases more. So it's, I think, quietly become an incredible success story. I think those of you who treat lung cancer would probably say we're in a co totally different world. Uh, than we were 10 years ago. Okay, so that's EGFR. Some of you may know about that. Um, BRAF mutations are not that common in lung cancer, maybe about 1%. This has been a problem. We haven't had good drugs against BRAF, although we have drugs in melanoma where it's very common. It's been hard to, to do the trials in, in lung cancer. And when it's been tried, you can look at the overall response rates. Chemotherapy, the response rate is only 9%. Single agent dibrafenib or vemurafenib, uh, RAF inhibitors had response rates that are on the lowish end. But now, as of about 2016, we have now attempted combinations, in this case dibrafenib and trametinib, with the response rates that's in the 60s to 70 percent range. So presumably that patient who's now resistant can go on to this combination and have a, a good outcome. But also all the other BRAF mutant lung cancer patients we now have what is a very nice, um, very nice treatment for those patients. We didn't talk much about it originally, but HER2 mutations are also present in about two to three percent of lung cancers. These are similar to EGFR mutations in that they're within the kinase domain. These are exon 20 insertions. These have been very difficult to treat. We haven't had, a, although we have a lot of drugs for HER2, of course, from breast cancer. Um, None of them have worked in this patient population. Um, this is some data coming from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Sloan -Kettering. These tend to be non-smokers, similar to, to EGFR patients. But just in 2018, we began to uh, see some decent responses, in this case, to an antibody drug conjugate to trastuzumab, using trastuzumab as the, the backbone. 
and you're, gonna, you're beginning to see on the order of 50% response rate in this population. So just in the past year, some real progress in that population. ALK we talked about a little bit. Um, crizotinib, um, I mentioned is a MET inhibitor in ALK. It's also a ROS inhibitor, so we'll talk about ROS briefly. Um, we developed this fish assay early on. Um, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'll skip through some of this. The, the phase one response rate to ALK looks something like this. ALK is about three to five percent of lung cancer patients, I should say. Right, it's about three to five percent. And when you find them, single agent crizotinib gives you a very nice response rate. Similar to what I've shown you for the other drugs, about 70 percent response rate. Most of the patients will relapse, half of the patients will relapse within 10 months. So it's a glass half full issue again, like, like with the EGFR inhibitors. And we began to understand and study the mechanisms of resistance. And many of them are driven by mutations similar to EGFR, mutations within the kinase domain. And while this may be a boring story that you have to retell for each, each of these individual genes, it's not boring for the patients. So I showed you the, the waterfall plot for the first generation drug, crizotinib. When you look at second generation inhibitors, which again were developed to begin to work against these mechanisms of resistance, you're like, wow, that waterfall plot looks just like the phase one trial of crizotinib. So you're giving patients again in at least an additional 12 months. Um, so patients did really well with these second generation inhibitors. Uh, it, when you look at head-to-head -head front line, first line uh, trials, looking at crizotinib against these second generation inhibitors, you can see these are doing much better. In fact, in this, in this, um, this study in New England Journal, out at 30 months, you still haven't reached median progression-free survival. So over half the patients still have not relapsed, almost out at three years, which is a phenomenal improvement in that patient population. Part of, part of the issue here is, is a PK issue. Electinib gets brain penetration in most of the crizotinib patients. The crizotinib does not penetrate the brain, so you have lots of brain CNS failures here. Electinib gets in the brain. ROS is something we began to study around 2010. The ROS fusions were first described in lung cancer in 2008. We knew that crizotinib uh, inhibited ROS from in vitro studies, but we really only started developing some diagnostics around 2010. CD74 ROS and SLC34A2 are the most common fusions. The ROS and ALK patient population is very similar. They're both around 50 years old. There's a preponderance of never or light smokers, so these diseases arise independent of smoking history. And like with crizotinib, the responses of patients who had ROS positive disease is really incredible, right? So the, this patient um, had almost two lungs completely full of disease. Many people may look at it and think they had pneumonia. It looks like the patient has pneumonia, not cancer. But this was the bronchial alveolar subtype of, of lung cancer, which has this appearance. You can see within three months you have a normal CT. So that's the pace and the quality of the response of ROS positive patients to in, in inhibition with crizotinib. Response rates really, really good for the ROS patient population. Sounds familiar, and now we're doing the same thing with resistance. I won't go through that story. So where do we stand with rearrangements? Rearrangements are really interesting targets. Most of the, the lung rearrangements appear to be the major driver in those tumor types, right? That appears to be a very strong oncogenic signal coming out of those. And what that means is, since most of them are kinases, it's relatively easy to develop a drug, and the tumor cells are so dependent on them that the drugs work really, really well. So these are probably a short list now of genes that are involved in actionable fusions within lung cancer that we're now looking at routinely. The prevalence of many of these are low. ALK is around three to five percent. Some of these others are very low. And because of the number of fusions, we moved away from fish and we developed this, this AMP technology which I won't, I won't go through. But we've learned a, a number of things. If I can summarize a lot of AMP data that we have from, from our clinical lab, is that fusion events are drivers in about 10% of all tested tumors. That's not just lung cancer. When you look across all tumor types, about 10% of our tumors have gene fusions as drivers. So we test every single case at this point using RNA for gene fusions. And about 15% of the rearrangements are not, involve novel partners. The 10%, the of course, this technology depends on knowing one partner. So we're not discovering new fusions using this. We might discover new partners. And in case of about 
of these uh, fusions we detect, we're finding a novel partner, so PCR and other things aren't great. What about rare fusions? Any of you, anyone who's attended ASCR or ASCO in the last year or two has heard a lot, or even USCAP now, I think. I saw a lot of NTRAC posters and stuff at, at USCAP. Um, knows about NTRAC. So NTRAC fusions are really important, but they're super rare. And especially in lung cancer, we found only a few. All of them have made it into publications or, or into drug approvals. Uh, of the 2,000 patients we screened, about 0.3 to 5% of the patients are positive. But it's almost the poster child for personalized medicine. Something that's so incredibly rare, one out of every 300 patients, perhaps. But when you find them, the patients benefit tremendously. These, these are now two FDA-approved compounds that have really changed the lives of these patients. The main, uh, the main job of some of these drug companies now, like Bayer, is to work with pathologists to actually find the patients. Right? The hard part is not delivering the drug, it's finding the patients. So this is uh, really the poster child for precision medicine and a reason why places like ours doing broad genotyping is absolutely the only way forward to find these kind of patients. Um, Medexon, I have two more genotypes if you can bear with me. As I said, I know this is a bit encyclopedic, and I always hated sitting through encyclopedic talks, but I think when you hear all of these stories and where we are with all of them, you actually come out of this talk feeling a little bit differently than probably you started. So MET Exxon 14 skipping is, for those of you who are in the lab, know a lot about it. For those who aren't, it's a fascinating, this is a fascinating genotype. The, MET, the Exxon 14 of the MET gene is uh, juxtamembrane, and it has a degradation domain. There are a subset of patients whose tumors have mutations at the splice sites of exon 14, which essentially remove as a cassette this degradation domain. And what does that result in? It results in high level expression of the remaining full length MET, including the tyrosine kinase domain. Essentially the equivalent of high level protein expression or the equivalent of like a gene amplification event, but it's driven by a mutation which removes its degradation. Here's, here's a pileup of a case showing a point mutation um, right at the right at the exon junction, the GU here of exon 14, and these patients do do really really well, but finding them is really hard. Um, and the reason finding them is hard has nothing to do with the prevalence. The prevalence is around four percent, which makes them the second most common actionable alteration after EGFR in lung cancer. Right, so it's EGFR then met exon 14. That's not what makes it hard. What makes it hard is the, mechanism, the, the methodology that you use to find them. We use RNA and DNA together. If you just use RNA alone, you run into a problem. And the problem is that exon 14 is skipped at a low level in normal cells. So any cell that expresses MET also has a low level of MET exon 14 as an alternative splice form. So anyone who's using ultra-sensitive methods to detect this will find positive metaxon 14 deletions in many cases that do not have splice site mutations and for which that is actually not a driver. The RNA is there and the protein is there, but at a low level and it's not driving the tumor. And those patients will not benefit from met inhibition. And so if you, if you map out the RNA reads in patients, you can see here, this is all the cases we tested. In, in yellow are cases that were non-zero using our AMP technology for MedExon 14, but were not true positives. If you only had RNA alone, um, these would be false positives. So a colonization domain. So almost all these are cytoplasmic fusion proteins where the 5 prime N offers dimerization, resulting in autodimerization and kinase activation. But as you can see, there are multiple either different partners or even within the same kit 5 b partner are multiple different breakpoints. So I should, this is a good slide to, to see the scope of the problem. The red patients are a little bit older than Ross and Al. They tend to um, they tend to be young smokers as well. And we've known about this, so as I mentioned, for 10 years, and we have red, we've had red inhibitors for many years. Those red inhibitors are generally poor and are or called multi-kinase inhibitors, where red is only one of multiple kinases they hit. Capazantinib is one of them. This is in vitro data uh, showing red, these red positive cell lines or, or tissue models with response to cabazantinib, which is one of the drugs that has been tried so far. And you can see most of these models do not respond. But the development of very specific 
very potent RET inhibitors has changed that. And this is a this is a compound from a company called Boxo. You can see almost all these models are responding. And we now have patient data, which is really impressive from this company, Loxo, that now the red, uh, the red patients pre and post therapy are now showing really impressive responses. So this would be the, this is the latest tumor, I think, that people will see a lot of information about. As pathologists, if you're doing AMP or other fusion detection, you certainly will pick these up. But we're going to be asked, like we're being asked for an interactive fund of these. Um, oh, yeah. And from ASCO 2018, this is the response for the red positive patient population. So, whew, I went through a lot of stuff. I hope that it wasn't too boring, but now you can, you can see you've really done an awesome job. There's some things we need to do. KRAS is the, I think, whatever you call it, the elephant in the room. KRAS is something we still found, and NIH has an entire building and project dedicated to KRAS mutations and how to treat them. We still haven't gotten any progress there. Um, they're downstream of EGFR. Um, and for that reason, they're very difficult. The challenges, I think I'll make this my last slide because I'm out of time. David already gave kind of my talk, so. <laughs> <laughs> but the challenges in targeting RAS, I think it's good to end on a failure, make everyone leave in the video. Um, transferase inhibitors, many of you who are older probably remember that there was this pharmacal transferase excitement maybe about 20 years ago. This KRAS is pharmacylated. Those inhibitors failed. Reversible inhibitors, KRAS is a GTPase, so things that can competitively bind to G with GTP, those have all failed because the new KRAS has a very high affinity for GTP. Um, the catalytic site is, is tough, is small, and it's tough to target. And using downstream pathway blockade, like I showed you for BRAF, just hasn't worked. It's been too toxic, and the combinations needed just haven't worked. So that's the bad side of things. There's, there's a slight glimmer of hope in the next year or two for inhibitors of a single isoform, I mean a single mutation within the U.S. called the G12C mutation, which is not the most common mutation to be honest, but the cysteine here can be used to covalently bond to um, a, a class of drugs that are being developed now that can, can bind to the pocket where, where the mutation is and covalently bind to the cysteine. And the, the idea, the original idea that we all had, certainly I had, is that once it's bound to, once the mutant KRAS is bound to GTP, it's just stuck there. And that's the, that's the active form of KRAS, and you're not going to interfere with it. But there's been some evidence that there is a slow amount of hydrolysis with a, a, a half time of 27 minutes, by which you can hydrolyze some of the GTP. And so if you have enough of this covalent binder around, it can sneak in during during this, this time, and once GDP comes off, there is a little bit of time to sneak in there. And that appears to be effective in in vitro models. So, a slight glimmer of hope for PRS, but an area where I think all of us can spend more time. I think I've given a lot of information. I'm going to skip over checkpoint inhibition. I'll show a slide. There's checkpoint inhibitors. There's cell free. Is that important? Early detection with cell free would be fantastic. We're pretty good at detecting tumors in stage four, but on stage one, we can wait for early detection. Let's work on that. Um, this is our cell free assay validation, showing we can detect mutations down around 0.1%. And this is a summary of a lot of the little fraction data from our cell free population as well. Patients with progressive and stable disease. So we've done a lot of cell free analysis. CMP analysis, monitoring patients without mutations, and this is, I think, my last slide showing monitoring of patients um, with breast cancer. This is literally my last slide. This is not my slide. This is from the Hopkins group. Some of you may have seen this paper called the Cancer Seek. I think the idea is probably similar to some ideas Jay Shindor has had for a while, that you could use some of the sequencing data itself to begin to say, Let's look at the cell free population and de determine where that tumor is from. You could use some of the sequence data to predict nucleosome binding. So we can, so BJ will be here because he, he's so, so brilliant. But the Hopkins group came up with this idea that not only do you kind of combine the mutation data in, in the cell free, but you also begin to use uh, serum protein markers. So they used uh, essentially eight serum protein biomarkers at the same time as the mutation data and did machine learning to predict if you found a mutation, what tumor type did you have? Right? 
it's kind of a simple question, but for the pathologist in the audience, the light bulb goes off quickly. It's like, uh oh, wait a minute. From a blood draw, you can tell what kind of tumor it is. And the mutation and how to treat the patient. That's scary. I mean, it's exciting, but it's also like, we need to, we need to think. So in, in their paper, they showed with 100% accuracy, they can tell whether a patient has colorectal cancer based on the cell-free mutation and protein uh, product marker. And they do pretty well for the other ones. And like with many of all those seen papers, these are paradigm changing. These are just the first example of how you could apply this. I think we're all going to be working on similar things and making it better. But I foresee in the next five to 10 years where, as pathologists, we're certainly going to have to be very focused um, on this area and, and embrace it rather than kind of fight against it. So, some simple conclusions. Um, I hope I convinced you that precision medicine continues to be important. Um, I think paired with immunotherapies, which I didn't talk about, we're going to continue to see major progress across many tumor types. I'm really, really optimistic that this is going to continue. The regulatory reimbursement issues, um, for those of you who are interested, know that there's a lot of turbulence in this area, and there's going to continue, I think, to be for the foreseeable future. We need to map out uh, how, how we can keep uh, sustainability and help our patients. And the last slide, I think, hopefully convinced you that CFDNA will completely change how cancer is monitored and detected. And I'm sorry for going over, but thank you for your time.